it's David, and you're listening to the Tone Bass Classical Guitar Podcast. For today's episode, I've got Matt Palmer on the show. Many of you probably already know him uh, for his really popular video on Tone Bass on AMI Right Hand Scales. We had a fun conversation uh, talking about his roots as a metal guitarist and then transferring some of the chops he had uh, from that style of music into uh, his classical guitar technique. We also talked about a couple of his upcoming CDs, and I've got a preview of the soon-to-be-released record title El Canto del Cipres. This is a really cool, rarely heard piece, Tipodi Moya Karavushka Domoy, by the Russian early classical composer Vysotsky.
I mean, some, but sometimes you walk in and you wish you had brought, like, you wish you had brought uh, something like this. Wow. What is that? This is a, uh, an acoustic spring reverb device <laughs> attached to a very cheap Cordoba guitar. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it cool? So it, does it use the vibrations of the guitar to act as like a transducer? Or? Yeah, it just, well, all it has is like, um, you see it's, it's attached here under the strings at the saddle. Put the strings That's are pulled amazing. to tension. And then it just, you know, you, it's not really here. It's in the guitar. Yeah. Right? <laughs> it's nuts. Does it, does it act kind of like old school plate reverbs? Is it kind of the same type I don't, of I, don't, I really don't know. I mean, yeah. I think it's, I mean, there are springs. So, I mean, I've heard of spring reverb and yeah. I just assume that's what it is. Yeah. So it, it's great to have you. You are the king of AMI scales. <laughs> How did that idea come about? Were you kind of one of the first players to do um, that? No, I was definitely definitely not the first player to have done it. Um, I mean, Narciso Yepes is a fine example of, of that, much much earlier than me. Um, but the idea came kind of out of necessity and maybe a bit of impatience on my part. You know, I'd, I'd been playing guitar for 10 years before I came to classical guitar and uh, was really quite good um, with my left hand, you know. and um, But I only played with a pick back in those days and... Uh, Transitioning to to classical guitar and trying to play scales with I M alternation, you know, I just was it was really slow going, mm -hmm. and I was nowhere near uh, you know the tempo of my left hand with with my right at the time. Gotcha. So I was just experimenting early on with with things like that, and um, I went through a lot of different things, even using you know P A M I like a tremolo technique and C A M I, <laughs> incorporating you know pinky into the to the oh, mix. Wow. Um, didn't have much success with either, either of those, but AMI seemed to be, you know, uh, the one, you know, you have that really efficient motion of, you know, moving in one direction, AM, A to I, um, and just having that extra finger. Um, and it went, um, you know, AMI scales went perfectly with my left hand scale technique, which was, which was basically based upon the three note per string scale technique that you know, electric guitarists or shredders or, you know, just renowned for. So Yeah. That's where it originally came from. Fortunately I had teachers who who let me, you know, who let me roll with it's it. It's good you have an old school teacher who said, Oh, you must use high and perfect alternation. Yeah, I got lucky too. I uh you know, my my first teacher, Billy Elverton, um, who was a great teacher and a great player, but he he went on sabbatical my second semester studying. Mm. And that's really when this these things started happening. Yeah. And I had a um um, another teacher, Richard Todd, who was taking his place, and um, and I showed it to him, kind of, you know, like, hey, can you keep a secret? I'm I'm trying this out, and he's <laughs> like, you know, there are other players that are doing that, and that's really all I needed to hear was like, it's okay to <laughs> to you know think outside the box, and yeah, try yeah, other things. So. And uh, I I totally know how you feel because I I've had the same problems, still do that. My left hand was always faster than my right hand. And mm. I had that alternation really fast. It's actually, it, it's not an easy thing. It's a very simplistic right. concept, but to actually even it out. So you started uh, more as an electric guitarist. You, you, were you a metalhead back oh, yeah. in high school? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was into anything from thrash metal to, you know, of course, heavy metal, death yeah. metal even. You know, it's like I, I really, um, I really liked that that kind of hardcore, technical, heavy guitar right, yeah. oriented music. And uh, how long were you played electric before? For, for 10 years. 10 years. Yeah, and, and really the, the transition was almost immediate. Once I started oh, really? studying the classical guitar, I just quit the electric guitar. Wow. <laughs> and what what was what, it that made you find, or maybe not find, but discover the classical guitar? Um, well, I guess when I was about 16 years old, my mom bought me this uh, Christopher Parketing D double CD set, okay. you know, called The Great Recordings. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, thank you. It was Christmas or something. I said, thank you. And I threw it in my closet <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for, for a couple of years. And that's that's the truth. Uh, and then I, um, for, for a brief period of time, I was listening to things like Aldi Miola and I was hearing you know, Paco de Lucia playing uh, with him. And uh, so I got that sound of the nylon string and shredding 
in the same listening experience, yeah. you know. So I, I guess it kind of uh, made me curious of what that CD was I had mm-hmm. in the closet. So I, I took it out and I listened to it, and you know, that uh, being a, a kind of a compilation album, it had like all the classics on it, you know, Recuerdos and Asturias. And listening to it, I, I was just hooked. You know, I, I just knew that like this was the next like technical challenge I needed to to look at on the guitar. Yeah. And I, you know, at the time I didn't read music. I was always transcribing things by ear or working with tab. Uh, but with that, you know, um, at that time when I, when I heard that CD, this was, uh, I guess, late 90s, you couldn't just go on the Internet and find tabs for everything, especially yeah, yeah. classical music. You know, <laughs> no way. So, um, so I was just learning still it. Still today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, it's, yeah, definitely you can't rely on anything you find out online. Also, so like guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I was transcribing all these pieces by ear. I'm just listening, hmm. playing back, and rewinding. Yeah, and and, uh, and that's actually, you know, what I auditioned with was these ear transcriptions. You know, I did the fugue from uh, BWV 1001, mm-hmm. and um, you know, of course, I had learned Asturias and Recuerdos. So I was playing the tremolo all wrong. Um, I was playing it uh, P and C together, so a true four note tremolo. Oh, okay. You know, going more uh, uh, flamenco tremolo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I guess that's a you know um, uh, kind of a uh, tribute to the illusion that tremolo is. You know, it makes you think that it's this yeah. continuous line, and I guess it was really done well in that recording. <laughs> it fooled me. You know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's uh, that's so interesting, and. Uh, so when you got to college, you pretty much, at least reading music, it was just a fresh start, right? Yeah. Right. Uh, what, yeah, what was that it was, like? Oh, it was bad. Was it frustrating? Yeah, it was frustrating. I mean, <laughs> yeah. imagine like your half-page etude. Yeah. You know, it, it was easy for me to play, you know, even with a right hand that was starting from scratch, it was, you know, fairly easy for me to play um, technically. But... You know, it takes me like all day to read through it. Yeah. <laughs> and fortunately, I had a good memory. So yeah, I could, yeah. I, I'd fight my way through something. Through once yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, w- would you say, uh, coming from a background of just picking music up by ear, do you think it kind of helped you along the way in regards to musicality on the classical side? More kind of listening to the music as a whole instead of being a bit too hyper focused on everything in the score? Yeah, I think I think so, and, and just you know that that background in in metal in general kind of goes along yeah. with that, you know, because those guys aren't really like your perfectionist kind of play it the same way every time, yeah, guys, yeah. you know, and and neither am I really. I mean, I I I like I would like to be able to play perfectly, I guess, but um, but but I don't, and I and I do kind of try to each performance make things. Uh, Make things new, you know, keep keep things fresh for me, you know, yeah. interpret as I go. So I've got to ask, who who are some of your idols back then and maybe today in the metal world for guitarists? In the metal world? I, I'd be curious to hear this from a classical guitarist perspective. Um, you know, I'm still a big fan of Marty Friedman's work. Okay. You know, he, the year he played with Megadeth, yeah. um, that uh, Rust in Peace album was just like, when that when I first heard that it was like you know, I don't know, getting hit with a bag of hammers or something, you know, I was just <laughs> whoa. Yeah. Just, and I, honestly, I uh I do remember the moment I, I first heard that album. I was actually asleep and my brother had this stereo, kinda like what you see back there, mm-hmm. big floor speakers, really loud. Um he had it set at his as his alarm. <laughs> <laughs> that would that would even wake me up. <laughs> and <laughs> And uh, one morning that this song called Take No Prisoners comes on, it's just like the heaviest sounding guitar riffs you could imagine, you know, and um, just woke up and I was like, whoa, what was that? You know, it's just like life changing <laughs> experience, you know, and uh, but the solo work, his solo work is just phenomenal. And he's just a really kind of unique voice on the instrument. I mean, I, if you compared him technically to a lot of other players, I mean, He's a he is a great player, but I mean it's just like his sound. You know? Yeah, no one sounds like that. No one writes like that, and um, so I definitely would say he's he's kind of at the top. And um, but I you know I I loved Ingve Malmsteen back in the day, and just you know just a monster player. Yeah, yeah. And 
you know, Jason Becker, John Petrucci. Okay. Dimebag Daryl, you know, and even, even, even like some of the really heavy guys like Kerry yeah, yeah. King, you know, Slayers, guitarists, you know, those, um, I, li- I liked a lot of that stuff, but I, I tended to gravitate m- more towards the, you know, the technical, very flashy players. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And I, and I learned so much from, um, from Paul Gilbert, you know, he had this, he had this video that I saw when I was, I don't know, in high school or middle school called Hot Licks. Oh, okay. <laughs> and it was like the cheesiest <laughs> kind of, you know, intro, uh, and transition things, uh, you could imagine, you know, even magic tricks I remember him doing. Um, you know, just uh, definitely a character of that guy, um, but a great player and a, and a great teacher. And for oh, someone really? who didn't really yeah. have a teacher at the time, you know, it yeah. was like to see someone that good who was willing to teach and Able actually to knew how to do it. Everything, yeah, yeah. yeah there was, uh, you know, I have to say, you know, even though I never sat with <laughs> with him, he he was probably one of my most in one of the most influential teachers oh, I that, had. That's <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, because it's not, it's not as often that. You find a, a good uh, pedagogical teacher in the metal world, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> but, it's, uh, it's true. Which is too bad, you know? Oh, yeah. Because it requires just as much technical need as classical guitar. And one of the things that bothers me is I think a lot of uh, classical guitarists kind of assume, oh, electric guitar players, for their tone, they just completely depend on their equipment. And yes, they're sure nice amplifiers good guitars will help yeah. you get somewhere but not any more than a nice classical guitar I, I mean the the tone is so fundamental to the player you know and i i forgot i forgot who it was but let's talk about an interview he saw he um mentioned that uh i think it was Jimi hendrix no not Jimi hendrix it was eric clapton jeff beck and jimmy page and they were all playing the same bill at some little club for some fundraiser or something. There was apparently just this really cheap Squire uh, electric guitar with the amp. And they're all just messing around about it. And even on that $200 guitar and amp, yeah. Jimmy Page sounded like Jimmy Page. Yeah. <laughs> Eric Clapton sounded like Eric Clapton. And Jeff Beck sounded like Jeff Beck. It, it's really, tone production is just as much of an art. It's just a, a different approach, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I... I've I've maintained about classical guitars, you know, as long as a classical guitar meets a certain level of a certain standard of excellence, you know, and its mm-hmm. build quality and and woods or whatever. Um, and it's so th- easy to find that today. There's yeah. so many great makers. Yeah, I mean that uh, you know, a, if a, if a great guitarist gets a hold of that guitar, it's going to sound like <laughs> a, a great guitar. Yeah. You know? um, and that being said, I mean, I I know that. Uh, each guitarist tends to find a maker sometime in their life that, you know, they, they kind of work with and gravitate towards that specific sound. Um, but I, I guess in, in electric guitar, it's about the same thing. You know, you get a decent guitar and really good amps and you, you just, uh, it's too, too, uh, you pull your parts sound of the out equation of for electric guitar. Yeah. 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 I mean, I guess it all, but it all, I guess it ends up being one instrument. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You have this stuff, you have, a guitar, and, and then hopefully uh, it all sounds good together. I wish this was a video uh, podcast. I love looking around this room. We've got behind you. I see about eight different guitars <laughs> and cases. And then we've got Marshall. Is that a half stack or full stack? Or? Yeah, that's a Marshall JCM eight hundred. And then we've 100 got watt. <laughs> and then we've got a Fishman. Uh, is that the loud box? And yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of everything. Yeah, <laughs> this is. Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff, like this, the Marshall you see behind me, that's that's stuff that I've had since my high school days yeah. that I just couldn't let go of. And I have a guitar like that. I used to play uh, Eric Slane uh, classical for years and years. It was my old guitar teacher, uh, Dieter Henning's instrument, mm-hmm. and he he sold it to me. And it, I think I played it seven years, and I, I've been with a new guitar now for two years, but I just can't get myself to, to sell it. And I still love going back to it sometimes. It's just... Yeah some feeling about that yeah there's something there's something about that guitar that you've had for so long and yeah i actually just got rid of mine the one one i had for do you regret it you or know, i don't or think was it time i think it was time you know i've uh you know for the past few years i've been playing michael thames guitars and i'm I'm really happy with, with with those instruments and this other guitar it was a great guitar i mean no doubt i recorded two albums with it a lot of mm-hmm. videos and i uh, played you know loads of concerts on it for over 10 years on that oh, guitar wow. yeah and for the past three years, it's just been in the case. Yeah. And, you know, 
I always said back when I only had one guitar, uh-huh. <laughs> and I know it looks different now. Yeah. But back when I only had one guitar, that guitar, I always would see you know collectors with these great collections of guitars and, and never said, playing them. Yeah, and I would say I never want to be a guitar collector, and that's kind of what I'd become with that. You know, I just like this guitar needs to be on a stage somewhere. Yeah, and fortunately, you know, a great player took the guitar so yeah it's sad when you see and nothing yep. against dentists if we have any dentist <laughs> listeners and i'm sorry if you are a collector but it is sometimes sad when you see these phenomenal collections but they don't get played at all yeah you know i i do know of one person at least one person um he's a film score composer mark mancina he did um music for august rush and tarzan and i think speed back in the day like kind of a lot of different stuff. He started off as a classical guitarist. He studied at Fullerton and then he went to composition, but he still loves the guitar. Mm-hmm. And he has one of the most wicked collections I've ever seen. <laughs> and he's like a kid in a candy store bringing it out. <laughs> and you can tell he loves it. Absolutely yeah. loves it. And this guy is incredibly busy, but he told me he plays an hour of guitar every morning before he starts composing, which is just amazing. And he loves having other people play on them and, and playing the guitars himself. Cool. That's got to be something, though, waking up and having to decide which which one, <laughs> which guitar. <laughs> I've only got two. <laughs> well, I've got some old electrics, but th- those are not good electrics. <laughs> so you got three CDs recorded and out in the public, and you've got two all set and ready to go. And if I'm correct, you, you uh, self-record these and produce and master them yourself? Yeah, do them yeah. all here. Like actually, right around the corner over there, right um, in the basement. Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah, for me, it's it's the it's the it's the best place to do it. It's just the convenience of being able to just walk downstairs in the middle of the night, uh, just to you know that night when you're in the mood to record. Yeah, and just do it then, as opposed to you know getting worried, loading all hundreds the, for yeah, session. loading all your gear up and. You know, by the time you set up, and I always record myself. I really don't involve anyone else in this, so it it would be on me. You know, setting up and uh, and that really just takes takes all the inspiration away. You know, to to actually play when you're, you know, bringing all your gear somewhere and you know, running the cables and even down here. You know, if I if I don't have everything set up and ready to go, I usually don't record that night. I yeah, just, yeah. I'll set it up in the morning or something, and then have it ready so in that yeah. moment. Yeah. sparks no it, it's all about capturing the performance i mean you can get the most fancy microphones cables preamps but if the musician's not inspired you know even if it's good playing but they just don't have that 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 that, that kind of magic in the performance if you don't yeah. capture it you know it's pointless um yeah absolutely i mean i think i guess all guitarists are probably guilty of of that you know like yeah. a few of the recordings just being like it was it was just a day in the office you a know <laughs> yeah um and also there's something you know with a live performance you know the nerves i think creates a bit of that magic but when it's yeah. a recording when you're nervous but it's not to an actual audience it's just to two microphones you know there it, it's uh it's not very natural a lot of times yeah. you know so i i and it's amazing with technology these days what you can do on I mean, microphones are expensive, but if you compare it to costs, you know, when you have to be recording onto tape and through consoles, I mean, it, it's dirt mm-hmm. cheap now and it sounds great. Oh, yeah. I mean, I I probably, I mean, just rough estimate. I mean, I, I don't know what I have in my gear, 4,000 bucks, 5,000 yeah. bucks, including the computer. And that's nothing, you know, really. I mean, if you, if you, just a roll of tape is 350. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you just look at how, how much, I've accomplished with that, yeah. that initial purchase, you know, yeah. um, three, you know, basically five albums now, two are yet to be released, but, um, that's a lot of, you know, a, a lot of work out of that, that equipment yeah, and totally worth it. If you take care of it, it lasts forever. And it doesn't, you know? doesn't lose its value either. Yeah. I mean, set of Neumanns. I mean, you, it's funny though. They'll, they'll get more valuable it, later it, on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when, aged. You know? <laughs> you know, everyone goes for these vintage microphones, but you know, <laughs> Those were used when people were smoking cigarettes and everything inside the studio. So you get them, they just have this weird kind of stench. It's like, I, I don't know. I never got that. <laughs> but you're, so you're using a Neumann 184s for your yeah. recordings? Yeah, I have a stereo pair of those. And actually, uh, I guess almost all my work has been done on those those uh, those mics. They're workhorse. They, yeah, they sound I've, great. Yeah, I've done some work with a you know, set of Sheps, you know, the, um, 
which were which were awesome too. But I, I don't own those, so it's yeah. not, not quite as convenient to yeah yeah to, to use those. But uh, when you yeah. use the stereo pair, are you um are you doing like a space pair, or do you do the aim one towards the bridge and one towards the yeah, deck? I'm doing yeah one towards one towards the bridge, kind of on the treble side usually, uh-huh. um, and then one towards yeah somewhere around the twelfth fret uh, of the neck. Um, and I guess I have them about a foot, maybe a foot and a half away yeah. from me. And they're spaced maybe two or three feet apart. Okay. Uh, though I've done different spacings on that. So yeah. I'm, some yeah. of my recordings, I've had them right on the same uh, stereo bar. Mm-hmm. So they're just a couple of inches away from, from one another. But um, recently, I've been separating them a little bit. I, th- I feel like it gives me a little, like, a, I don't know, a wider image or something. Uh, a little know. more depth in the sound. Yeah. Yeah. And... Um, because it's fascinating how different, you know, the sound of a guitar is from different parts of the room. Or if you're getting your ear right up to the instrument, you know, I've kind of played around just pointing a microphone while someone's playing it. it it's shocking. Oh, yeah. And, and if you're recording, um, you know, a bit of advice, sit still. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> the same thing with what you just said, if you're moving around, waving oh, yeah. your body around, that's basically just like moving yeah. the mic around, yeah, mic no, in different uh, parts of your guitar. It, it definitely makes uh, it tricky. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that is tough. If, like if you're a, in performance, I mean, I'm not like, you know, uh, you know, really dramatic when I'm performing as far as like body motions or anything. I'm, I'm even fairly just a stable. chair squeak in a recording yeah. can be detrimental. Yeah, I mean, and I, but I do move around. Yeah. So it is, it, it is a challenge to, to actually sit still and, and sit the same way every take, you know, because if you're, yeah, it's, it's might as well be, might as well have been done in a different room. If you're pointing a different direction <laughs> when you sit down for take two, you know, yeah, so. it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty crazy. And yeah. so if you're, if you're recording for a record then, or, or CD, do you kind of, do you tape your chair markings down and oh, yeah. have all the settings exactly the same? So. I, I made the mistake of putting, well, maybe it's not a mistake. I, I, put gorilla tape on my carpet over there oh nice <laughs> and it's not coming up yeah. <laughs> so so, so uh, it's a permanent uh, so spot yeah now. yeah it's marked <laughs> so what's on the what's on the program for the next two cds um, that are to be released the, the one that's going to come first is a cd i made on um, a la leona torres guitar replica oh okay. made, by, made by michael thames it's a you know it's a spruce top with a with a cypress back and sides and um, just a really beautiful guitar. Yeah. And just probably the best sound I've ever recorded, you know, just so, so beautiful. Uh, even has the Tornavaz and everything in it. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that, that album is, I think it's some of my, some of my best work on that album. Oh, okay. we, we did most of it on location at this, uh, church, um, the San Miguel mission in Santa Fe. Okay. And it was just, I was so inspired. It was like, it's like one of those, moments that we captured you know yeah it's like i flew to santa fe and met michael with the guitar and i was so excited to have the guitar i was so inspired and then we went to this church and the sound was so beautiful and i was playing just the right music at the time i was yeah. really into All the music just came together and we captured you know a, a few of those pieces on there just just spectacular i mean i, I really love the whole album but i listened to a few of those and i'm just like a hundred years from now, someone's going to listen to this and say, wow, that was a, that that's was a, a good, good sound. Yeah. A good day. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. There, so. there is something uh, so inspiring with beautiful acoustics like that, especially oh, churches. And oh, yeah. we talked about it a bit before. Um, I know Norbert Kraft in Toronto, he, um, the engineer behind all the, uh, guitar recordings for Noxos, at least in the past decade, uh, he records in a very, inspiring sounding church and you know there there's always the two different kind of ways about going about it being more in a dry acoustic like here Mm -hmm. in the basement which ways is a bit easier because you don't have to deal with more external factors you know um than adding reverb and post or just capturing it naturally but uh but i i love both you know and sometimes they work better than others just kind of depending on the project but uh yeah that's great to hear it's um it is challenging down here if I'm recording here to be inspired in that way, you know, just like something about, you know, playing in a beautiful space, you know, that's, I think it's one reason I, I feel like sometimes I play better live because, because that inspiration is there. I mean, you hear what we're, what I'm dealing with down here. It's just dead. Yeah. No, no, you know, nothing um, uh, coloring my sound down here. So to get out and perform in some, in a place like that, just, 
is, is amazing. But you know, I I may I may do another album that way where I where I will actually travel somewhere to a beautiful space and record just to capture that inspiration. Yeah. You know? And what um, was um what was on the program? So is that a Tori's guitar? I'm assuming kind of more traditional I did, repertoire. I did or? quite a lot of Tariga on on that album. Oh, that must I, have been a blast. Yeah, and um, and I did, um, you know, I got a really unique recording of Capriccio Arabe. You know, it was, uh, you know, I listened back to it now, and I was just like, wow, I don't know if I would ever do that that way again. You know, <laughs> but it, you know, it's you know, part of me is just like yeah, that was that was brilliant. And at the same time, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> but it's just like it's really unique recording. It was because of all those circumstances coming together at the same time. You know, yeah. it's like. Um, and uh, you know, I did. There's some arrangements on there, some Scriabin arrangements I did, and um, oh, beautiful! An arrangement of Schindler's List I made. I actually made that, you know, like the week before going there. Oh, really? So that's another wow. reason I think you know all these things. Like I said, the repertoire just comes was there. together, and uh, yeah, I was really inspired to play that piece on that guitar. It was, uh, well, I talked about this uh, in season one. One of my favorite uh, songs, "Under Pressure," that was just kind of a collaboration last second. Uh, Queen and David Bowie were in the same building recording, and they got together at midnight, started jamming, and at six in the morning they had that song completely recorded. You know, sometimes that excitement, if something just comes really organically, it yeah just produces an amazing performance. Yeah, and then the the second recording, um, what was there a concept be, behind that record? Well, the the second recording is really just a, it, I guess it's more of a compilation album. So it's a, you know, things that I've recorded over the past like 10 years that I've mm -hmm. never released and some really great things on there. You know, I have these, there's three or four Tom Waits arrangements on there that oh, are just, okay. you know, really, really beautiful stuff. And, you know, quite a lot of pieces that um, um, I've been commissioned to record, you know, some world premiere recordings that I've made, you know, over the years that, you know, I'm, I'm sitting on here and knowing that I should put them out on a disc so yeah uh it's it's a really unique album it, it's you know it's not something it's not something you see every day because there's probably about six or seven different guitars on that album oh really that you would hear wow. you know because you know just imagine it over a period of 10 years yeah you know, yeah this so it's a it's a matt palmer greatest hits album then. yeah i guess <laughs> so or greatest hits you've never heard kind of thing <laughs> most, most uh yeah Hey, I'm trying to think of a good name. I, I would need Bill here to do yeah, that. I, I know. <laughs> well, naming something's like the hardest thing ever, you know. Yeah. I with with naming my albums, I usually just name them after a a song on the album. Yeah. And uh, my first album, uh, I I I realized I needed some kind of way of naming it because I'm just terrible at this. Yeah. And it wasn't going to be a recital. I just didn't want to call it recital. Guitar recital. You know, it's just, uh, it, it, that's been, that so many it's times. been released, you know, yeah. we've, we've seen that. Um, so I thought, you know, I'm just going to, every album I release, I'm just going to name it after the first song on the album. Okay. It makes it easy. But on my first album, I named it Un Tiempo Fue Italica Famosa. <laughs> 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 it was the first song on the album. It, probably a bit of a mistake, you know, to to name it that, but that's yeah, fun. Maybe, and I actually sold the last of that album. I'm gonna have to re-release it at some point. Maybe I'll shorten the name, Italica Famosa. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I like that. Thank you, Matt, for being on the show. Please join me in two weeks for a conversation with David Leisner. Leave things today with another track from Matt's upcoming CD, El Canto del Cipres. This is a beautiful Scottish tune written in the Baroque period by Neil Gow called Lament for the Death of His Second Wife. I'm David Steinhardt, and we'll see you next time for the Tone Bass Classical Guitar Podcast. <laughs>